the bloodline is crumbling again, but this time there, it's cl- crumbling between the Usos. Mm. We haven't seen that bit yet. Interesting. Oh. I'm Tempest, host of the Wrestle Talk podcast, SmackDown Review here, alongside my lovely and wonderful House of the Black Mask brother, Sat E Niangi. What time is it? It is Sat E time. On Sat E Day, my sinuses are blocked. So if it sounds like someone's holding my nostril, that is because I'm getting decreased oxygen into the nozzle. Okay. Into the nozzle. Into the nozzle, yeah. Into the nozzle right here. So yeah, please bear with me if I sound like I'm pinching my nostrils. I'm trying to get through it. I left my nasal spray at home. Tempest, you're the only person that's making me live right now because I can't do this and talk at the same time. What are we talking about? We talking about the bloodline. Yes. It's Saturday. We always have the bloodline to talk about, the bloodline to keep us company. Because there was a lot that happened on this show regarding the bloodline. I still have this belt, by the way. Because it's yours. He's the rightful jam that champion. I'm the acting jam that jam. No, no, no. Peter. He is the official. He defended it. It's called, yeah, Finders Keepers. It's on his shoulder. It's his. If you want the title, if you want it back, you fight him for it, fisty cuffs or a quiz. That is your option. You're the champion. He's my champion. House of the Black Mask. We're only up. The house wins. There's no losers in the group. And I refuse to jump to anyone. That's why I don't do any of the shows. You're the champion. I need to carry this man around with me. He's a pretty good hype man. But this show, this SmackDown show, kicks off with the bloodline, with Paul Heyman and Sol Sokoa already in the ring. And before they could even get a word out of their mouth, Jay Uso. <clears throat> Jay Uso comes down to the ring and he tells Sol Sokoa, hey man, you turned on your big brother. You don't do that. You don't do that. That's not what we do in the bloodline. And. This is about where Paul Heyman says, all right, Solo, you, you can step back. It's okay. There will be no violence here today. No. And he starts talking to Jay. And he said, Jay, at Night of Champions, Jimmy decided for both of you. He made the decision for both of you to turn on the tribal chief, to kick Roman Reigns in the face. And you know why he did that? It's because Jimmy knows what everybody else in the bloodline knows. Jimmy's always resented you because you, main event Jey Uso, have always been Roman Reigns' hand-picked successor, the right-hand man and the next tribal chief. And it, it, as soon as he starts saying this, Jay is kind of like, ooh, damn, I actually like the sound of that. That, that that's, that's pretty good. Sounds enticing. Sounds enticing. And Paul Heyman says, you need to stop worrying about this. We... We have gotten you a United States Championship match. Singles champion Jay Uso here on the horizon. How does that sound? All we need is your allegiance. We need you to make this decision. Where do you stand? And Jay Uso just kind of says, like, all right, I'll take that U.S. title match. The rest of it, I'll let you know. That's funny. So I thought this was a very good segment, a very good opening segment. For a number of reasons. Yeah. First, Jay goes out there to confront Solo Sokoa and say, you don't turn on your brother like that. But then as soon as something enticing is kind of thrown his way, Jay is, Jay is kind of like, oh, but you know, actually, though, like that that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good, though. He's no, he's no fool, though. No, he's not. He's not. But even still, he can be tempted. He can be tempted by this other side. So that's one thing. Number two is I really like that we like we come on this podcast often and say that when Roman Reigns isn't here, it doesn't feel like anything happens in the bloodline story. True. You know, because the main character's not there, and a lot of the times it's just, you know, people spinning their wheels. This was a, an opportunity for them to advance this story without Roman Reigns there, and Paul Heyman, as the, the voice of Roman Reigns, was still able to be like exactly as manipulative as Roman is by trying to entice Jay. So this could have been a, a tenth as, as subtle 
in just this the presentation of this opening segment, and I thought it probably still would have been very good, but this I thought was just great. You're saying that it had a potential to be a throwaway uh, segment or throwaway show, and it didn't. Yeah. And um, like you said uh, at the beginning of the show, you're alluding to this is probably like the millionth time that like the bloodline's been crumbling, and it's been the millionth time that Jay had to choose between his brother Jimmy and Roman Reigns, but only this time. They did something they haven't done in a while. Because back before Jimmy came back, Jay Uso was enjoying somewhat of a solo success. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess it was kind of like Paul Heyman had to go to his bag of tricks. It's like, hmm, what was it that made Jay like being in the bloodline? Which was being called the right hand man and being called main event Jay Uso. Mm-hmm. So he hasn't been main event Jay Uso in a while or even the right hand man in a while because Solo actually is now the right hand man, but they won't say it out loud because that's part of the manipulation. Uh, what, what I found is fascinating was the whole big brother line. Question, Tempest, if you had a twin brother that was older than you by like a few minutes, would you call that twin brother your older brother? I feel like that would be something where someone would say it to me to rile me up, you know? Because yeah. it's like, you're twins, you're practically equal, you were born just minutes apart. If that's like, nah, that's your older brother, I'd be like, man, shut up. Right, yeah, you had the same teacher. No, because I just find it fascinating, it's like our older brother. And I'm like, there's only a few minutes between you and Jimmy. You've 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 seen life as much as he has. Mm-hmm. You've experienced the same milestones because you've got the same birthday. But I just that that I find it fascinating. And I went to ask someone, I was like, you know, Tempest, is, is that is that uh, considered normal in the in the twin community? Not that I don't I don't know for me. I was like, oh, it's a bit it's a bit wild. But besides that, I, I appreciate they'll do something different because it, it came to a point where it's like We've been making fun of the Bloodline storyline since WrestleMania. Like We're saying that Roman doesn't need to be champion. I still agree with that because most of the feud is not being around the title. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I understand that Roman's motivations, it involves being champion. And without it, you know, it's kind of like he can't call himself the tribal chief. But it can, we can still tell the storyline without the title. But in this instance, I... It's kind of like, it still doesn't throw away the fact that uh, Jay didn't come up with an answer because it felt like the way they alluded last week is like this was the week that Jay needed to answer and Roman was going to be there. And then Roman's not there. And it's just Jay and, and Jimmy and Solo. And, I, and then they used a clever way of enticing a title match. And I hate the fact that they did that because I, we're going to talk about the results later. I wanted the outcome that we ultimately didn't get. Yeah, so... That was how they opened the show. And now there were a few segments throughout the show that built to the main event, which was this United States Championship match. And the first one that we got was Jay Uso backstage and who comes and finds him but Sami Zayn. Basically just to be like, the same thing that we've heard a million times. It's the same segment. I'm going I'm to do the bit I'll do. Uh, it's going to be every week, but you don't watch Raw. But I watch bits of Raw. There was a segment where Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn gleefully uh, gloated in the ring. The bloodline situation is beyond our back. It's got nothing to do with us. Actually, no, it was backstage before Imperium came in, actually. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with them. They got asked that. They're like, well, it happened. Well, you know, I don't want to say I told you so, but whatever. It's got nothing to do with us. We moved on. And that's when Imperium came in. Yeah, you, of course you moved on, but you got another issue with us, blah, blah. That was Monday. But then go back to Friday. Sammy's back again doing the same speech he's done a thousand times. You'd think this man didn't kick him in the face multiple times. You'd think they didn't have a match at WrestleMania, a blood feud. You'd think they didn't have a match at Backlash. You'd think they didn't still... They were, they were still on horrible terms. It's bizarre. What they've done to Sami Zayn here is almost, almost, almost taking away the goodwill that he's built with the fans because it makes him come across as naive. If anything, that when Kevin Owens ultimately turns on Sami Zayn, you'll be like, you know what? This is one of the rare times where I agree with Kevin. Because no matter how much that man with his blood pressure is trying to move on, Sammy, to the point Sammy's kind of dragging him in. Oh, I have to go check on him. He needs, he doesn't need you. He has his family. His name is Jimmy. Let Jimmy pick up the piece, Sammy. Sammy, look after your brother. His name's Kevin. So this whole scene for me, it made Kevin, um, it made Sammy Zayn seem kind of like, I don't want to say the word naive, but a busybody. It's got nothing to do with you. You don't get involved. 
Don't get involved. They might trick you. This could be another trick for the tag titles. And they might sucker kick you in the ring. Think about that, Sammy. Stay away. Very well said. Because the segment after this was Jey Uso getting ready in the locker room. And Paul Heyman comes up and says, like, oh, it was real good TV. You left me hanging there at the handshake. You know, it's a cliffhanger. I get it. I built all my, my career off of cliffhangers. I, I understand. But I need your passport. Because you're which is interesting. You need to give me your passport because you are going to be flying to Money in the Bank right here in London, England with Roman Reigns. You're going to be flying there next week. Roman Reigns is going to be on SmackDown. He wants to have a celebration, a, a, a ceremony of some sort. And he wants to acknowledge three things. He wants to acknowledge the tribal chief. He wants to acknowledge the new United States champion. And he wants to publicly acknowledge Jay Uso as the next tribal chief. This led to Jay again being like, oh, yeah, it sounds pretty good. He's jovial. He's in a good mood. And he's like, I don't know why you're so happy though, Paul. Because if I'm in the bloodline, you're not in the bloodline. So a real ultimatum here, which it's pretty big. It's either Jay Uso's in the bloodline or Paul Heyman is. And Paul Heyman's been there since the start of this whole shindig. I don't know which way that's going to go next week. <coughs> if I was Jay Uso, that's a bad game plan to tell Paul Heyman you're going to kick him out because Paul Heyman is like a rat. is like a vermin. He finds mm -hmm. a way to survive. And let's just say Jay Uso did uh, go back to the bloodline. That would make Paul Heyman super paranoid. Mm -hmm. to the point where he would start dripping poison in Roman Reigns' ears. And we all know that Roman Reigns is a paranoid individual. It doesn't take much to convince him someone's trying to usurp him in the bloodline. So I enjoyed it for what it was. It telegraphed to the crowd, to us, that Jey Uso is leaning towards being a baby-faced or tween or whatever he is at the moment. And that the moment when it comes, poor Heyman is going to get a double super kick. That'd be very interesting. I don't know if that's going to be next week, but maybe not, considering how this show ended. Because we had a backstage promo with Austin Theory who says, like, you know, if, if Paul Heyman's looking for a client ne after next week, uh, maybe he should watch Austin Theory live. And I don't think that's going to happen. But Austin Theory cut his little promo saying he was going to retain the U.S. title, just like he did at WrestleMania against John Cena. We go to the main event. The main event segment on this show was the United States Championship match between Jey Uso and Austin Theory. Now, they had, like, they had a fine little match, but the actual match portion of all of this was fairly short, you know, in comparison, at least. They hit their moves. Austin Theory hit his, like, roll into the ring, jump up, drop kick thing. And Jey Uso hit a splash, but the referee was knocked out of the ring. Yeah. And he gets a visual pin on Austin Theory. And as soon as he got a visual pin, I was like, oh, he's not winning. There's his little victory, but I really wanted this man to win the title. I did, too. Even though, it, it, I don't know about you, if he had won, do you think it would have made the storyline even more interesting? I, I think so. Where the allegiance would go, because you'd be like, he got the title, right? So here's the thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll go through the finish very quickly, because it breaks down real hard. Yeah. Jey Uso is stood in the ring. And the referee's been knocked down, as I said. And Pretty Deadly come in. Pretty Deadly. We wondered last week if Pretty Deadly were going to be, like, actually aligned with Austin Theory. Or if that was just, like, a six-man tag for a week, whatever. They seem to be backing him up now. They seem to actually be helping with his invested interests. He then... Lost my train of thought. Pretty Deadly show up. They get run off by Jimmy Uso, saves the day. This is the first time we've seen Jimmy on this show. And then Solo runs in. Solo stops Jimmy, grabs him, is about to hit another Samoan spike. And then Jay Uso stops him. So he holds onto the arm and he kind of pulls him away. Solo shoves him into the ropes. He bounces back. Jimmy goes for a super kick. Solo moves. Jimmy nails Jay with a super kick. And he's like, oh no, I've, I've ruined the day. And then Jimmy and Solo kind of brawl. They fall to the outside. And this is when the referee regains consciousness. And Austin Theory slides into the ring and pins him, retains the title. No title change here on SmackDown. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the match, the end of the main event. And as Jimmy is helping Jay up, Jay is all 
you know, he's crabby. He's he's upset because he wanted to win this match, and Jimmy, his brother, has cost him this. It was an accident, but he cost him the match. And and Paul Heyman and Solo Sokoa are on the ramp, and they're looking at him just like, I don't know, like, where are you gonna, where are you, where are the allegiances lying here, man? And Jay walks out of the ring, and he walks past them, walks up the ramp, and as the show is ending, Paul Heyman just whispers into his phone, "Call Roman." So. That's how we left things here. Now, obviously, the story going into next week is Jay is upset with Jimmy for having cost him this match. It was an accident, but will he see it that way? Will he be able to put that aside and then make a decision? I don't think that would have been as interesting as what we could have gotten. Yeah. Which was, if Jay Uso won the United States Championship here, because you're not doing anything with this run with Austin Theory. I was and may- thinking that. Maybe, like, maybe they will at some point, but as of this moment in time, they're not. But Jay Uso winning the U.S. title and being shown, like, hey, if you align with the bloodline, these are the benefits that you will get. Like, that's how you win someone over. That's how you don't want him to be making that decision because he's angry at the other side and at your side, but today he just happens to be angrier at Jimmy than he is at Roman or Solo. You want him to be thinking, hey, yeah, this is why I was in the bloodline. Like, I was in the bloodline because it was getting me titles. It was getting me that Andre the Giant Battle Royal trophy. <laughs> you know, we were getting records. Like, we were, we were running this place. And if you give him a little bit more of a taste of that, I think that's a much more subtle story that you could tell. Just win him over with results. Show him why he should be in the bloodline as opposed to what we've kind of gotten, which is more just, I don't know, a a bit more standard, I think. To add to your point, what was Solo thinking? Yeah. If you you break it down, because when you're doing the, the the match breakdown, I realize it. Solo came out. So Jimmy was the first one to arrive at the scene. So Solo was a bit late. But Solo was a bit like tunnel vision. Like, okay, Jimmy's there. I'm going to attack Jimmy. When it should have been, in a weird way, let's put a beef to one side and help Jay win the, the title. Yeah, it was a little strange. Because you can argue, because I know the super kick, uh, the, the, what we all saw, the, what, what was the most impactful of that scene was the super kick. But if you break it down, both men are culpable for what happened. Because mm-hmm. Jimmy came out with honest intentions to save his brother. But Solo came out with ill intentions to attack his older brother. So if you, I could argue Solo was the one that m- made a mess of things because he went for the Simone Spike. Jay had to interfere. By interfering, it put Jay in, in harm's way. Jay would have been in harm's way if Solo did not create that whole scenario. If he just helped his brother to get rid of Pretty Deadly and then let Jay win, then attack him, cool. Mm-hmm. So I hope that Jay watches back the clip or whatever and see that's how the whole thing broke down. But you're right. Solo could have done that. That could have been Paul Heyman's objective. Solo, make sure Jay wins. But we didn't see any of that. It, it, it's kind of like one of those things that got lost in the source. That should have been Solo's objective, which is to help Jay win, to convince Jay to join the bloodline again. And that didn't happen. So it's a shame. And like you're saying, Austin Theory's title reign has been quite dormant since he's gone to SmackDown. In the beginning, he had Bobby Lashley and Sheamus challenging him. But it seems like at this current time he has no one on the horizon to challenge him this is why later on we talk about cameron graham so that's going to be one of my grab i'm going to mention that there should be a lot more people on that show challenging him heck grayson waller just that's give him gonna bring up. just give it just give it great even in both heels this, let's just find a way let's do what they used to do back in the days a old-fashioned 20 man battle royal to win against the united states title let's just do that you know because no offense to austin theory he's at that point where because of how much opportunities has that been given to him, this title race should have elevated him because once he loses it, he should be main event. Kind of like Gunter right now as Intercontinental Champion. No doubt, once he loses that title, he's got straight for the main uh, heavyweight championship. Yeah. With Austin Theory, you, you look at me like, oh, I can see you adding a few more IC or in, uh, United States title reigns to your belt because you're not quite there yet. Because it seemed like they were starting to use him right, Austin Theory, but he's kind of regressed since Mania, so that's a whole different story for another time. But in terms of the Bloodline storyline, I, I, I was pleased. But Jay should have won. That would have been more interesting. Uh, you know, the United States of Jay. 
<laughs> the U the US of J. The USJ. Oh J can you see? <laughs> yeah, that that, that would have been great because it would have given us something different. Like you say, in the United States title right now, nothing's happening. That would have been a shot in the arm, even if it's just a, a month title reign or a couple of weeks title reign. It, it would have been better than what we have right now. Yeah. There's, I'll, I'll let y'all in on a little behind the scenes uh, tea here in the offices. Uh, there, there are discussions about like, oh, I wonder what topic Tempest is going to pick for the next survival series and this and that. That is a common topic. And make sure you go and check out the latest one, Money in the Bank winners, over on Parts of Unknown. But when everyone sits down, they always kind of have been saying for a day or so beforehand, boy, I hope it's not United States champions, because nobody can figure out anything that's happened with his belt lately. Because it <coughs> so much has not mattered. It so much feels like just go down the list of priorities on WWE's list at the moment. That's fascinating you said that. You, you should definitely go United States. That that I think now that you said that, that's like the shameless it, it's, uh, it's got a title thing. Now, actually, you should withhold. No, no, don't do it. He should withhold it for the longest time. I want fans to start flooding their Twitter accounts, the YouTube channel, and say, we want US Survival Series trivial, trivia. We want Survival Series trivia. We want United States. We want it. They should do that. You should do that down the line. I love the idea. You should do it. It but is a good idea. It is a great idea. When you said that, I was like, why haven't you done it? Because but it's hard. Exactly. That's it's, what it's real hard. This comes like, from someone I refused to job. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll see. I think the Jay should have won. I still think that the job done on this show, in terms of the bloodline, was very good, especially for an episode that did not feature Roman Reigns. I think they progressed the story. I think they did a very good job with that. I just would have liked that to have gone a different way in the main event. But let us know what you thought about this whole episode of SmackDown, the developments in the bloodline. Should Jey Uso have won the United States Championship? Would you like to see that topic on an episode of Survival Series? Let us know all of the above in the comments flood the Twitters. down below. Flood the YouTube channel, flood the Twitters, flood the Patreon, and, and, and demand it, and we're going to withhold it until you guys can't take it anymore, and then maybe it's a Christmas present. Boom. Uh, don't you book my show. I got plans for Christmas. Anyway. Oh, anyway. Snap. December, December. <laughs> yeah. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the Wrestle Talk podcast channel if you haven't already. For the time being, we're going to get into the rest of SmackDown because there were also a lot of qualifying matches and championship implications on this show because we had our first match of the night which was a Money in the Bank qualifying match between Santos Escobar and Mustafa Ali. Now, this was a really fun match. It was a sprint. Like, it wasn't that long, but you get a guy like Mustafa Ali who will absolutely make the most out of, like, a six-minute TV match. Yeah. It's not surprising. He's fantastic. I've been a big fan of Mustafa Ali forever. Took a picture of him a few years ago at SummerSlam in Toronto. Good guy. This guy is someone I would have liked to have seen in Money in the Bank. And we've been saying that about a lot of the different Money in the Bank qualifying matches, at least on the men's side, whether it be Montez Ford and LA Knight. And I think that does, again, speak to the quality of WWE's roster right now. But in this match, it was Santos Escobar who got the win. There were a lot of really good highlights in this match. They did a Hurricane run to the floor, a Poison run in the ring, topes, suicide dives. Uh, Mustafa Ali hit a Tornado DDT in the ring. And eventually, it took an avalanche phantom driver from Santos Escobar in order to get the win. <laughs> LA Knight was on commentary for this match. He didn't add a whole lot, but like he's better on commentary than most WWE stars are. And after the match, the rest of the LWO came down to ringside and they all celebrated together. Babyface win. I liked it. Uh, when you mentioned Mustafa Ali, I didn't become a fan of his until probably when he came to SmackDown and when he turned heel because uh, I hated his feud with Cedric Alexander. Heart! Yeah. Soul! Show me your soul! Yeah, yeah. I, I, no offense, Mustafa Ali with a bodysuit I wasn't a fan. Mustafa Ali, when he started wearing tights and his hair grew longer and he started cutting promos. Fan of that guy. Although he did have that bonehead moment when he didn't get the briefcase. How fast is Brock Lesnar? I, I don't know. Not that fast. But he was fast enough to prevent Mustafa Ali from getting the briefcase. So it, they ha there's been like moments where they've dropped the ball with him. And he's one of those guys that he's really, really talented. 
who knows? Maybe because his contract's running up, he may be able able to show it the true Mustafa Ali with the with the chains, you know, broken. But in this instance, because he's been in Money in the Bank before, I can forgive why he lost because we've been saying on this uh, channel for a while that um, LWL and Santos Escobar yeah. need signature victories, and this is the kind of output trajectory that we were hoping for. And I'm happy that Santos won. And who knows, Ali could potentially win the last chance battle royal, whatever it is they, they're going to do for uh, the final spot for the money in the bank. But it was a good sprint of a match. It goes to show you, if you give these guys 20 minutes on, on a on a PLE, they're going to kill it. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy that it, it seemed like the book of LWO, since they've moved them away from Judgment Day, has been increasingly better since Bad Bunny sprinkled his... Uh, star power <laughs> on the group they've been on an upward trajectory who knows maybe uh, you know jo Joaquin and 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 um, uh, Mendoza maybe uh, is it Cruz it was Cruz de Toro I still remember mm -hmm. I look I still remember yeah. his old name that's a trivia question yeah Cruz de Toro maybe they can go for the tag titles because it seemed like everyone in LWO including Zelina they're on an upward trajectory so yay yeah, no, I totally agree. And uh, as far as these two guys go, I would definitely have gone with Santos Escobar to be in the match over Mustafa Ali, but I would still like to see both. Why I not agree, both? Yeah. Very good match, though. Very good opener here. We had the backstage bit with Jey Uso and Sami Zayn that we've already talked about. And then we had a very interesting segment yeah. where Kayla Braxton brought out Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. The unholy Union. Sure. She called them the NXT Women's Champion, and then Michael Cole was immediately like, the NXT Women's Tag Team Champion." What's the difference? They are women's champions. It, it's true. But they come out, and they don't get a chance to really say anything either until Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler come out. And they come all the way down to the ring. And I asked this in my edited review, and obviously that hasn't gone out at the time that we're recording this, but... I do not know the answer. Maybe you can tell me. Because Shayna Baszler is like, I'll tell you some history about those titles. I'm the reason those titles even exist. And I, for the life of me, cannot understand what the hell kind of point she was trying to make. I, I, I don't even listen. I, I was trying to think. When she said that, I was like, yeah. Because at that time, when the title was invented, you were on the main roster. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or... Was there a time that was she tag team champions when it was invented? Is she is she Maybe? trying to say was, I think was her was Nyla her, champion? Her and Nia, because this is like going into no. Wait a minute. Exactly, because I remember. Yeah, that's Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. Why was it created? What? No, but why was it created? You guys couldn't be fighting champions on different shows. Is she taking credit for the laziness? <laughs> yeah, that that did stump me as well because I was trying to figure out why. Because in my head, I was like, "You've never been NXT mm -hmm. Tag Champions. The title was created when you're on the main roster, but was she Tag Team Champions when that happened?" I think she might have been. I think it was her and Nia because it was like just prior to WrestleMania uh, 37, wasn't it? But I feel like the champion at the time we were excited about them defending on different shows. You don't sound like the title to be excited about <laughs> Nia defending tag titles. Yeah, we have to go back and, and find out the footage because it wasn't specified why we should fake Shayna Baszler because for a lot of people that was a bad decision. Although I do feel like there was more useful tag teams in NXT because of it. Because Katanya Chance and Caden Carter put on a great tag match against uh, Ronda and, and Shayna this past Monday, by the way. It sure. Was, it, 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 was a, it was a good match. It was a great introduction for that tag team. So for me, I'm, I'm quite excited to see what uh, Shayna and Ronda will do with that unholy union. Well, anyway, this, this match or this line that still is very questionable aside, yeah. they said that there is not enough teams in the division for all of them. And ain't that the truth? Because this then led to Isla Dawn and Alba Fire accepting a unification match. Who would do that? I, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I, but sure, I'll roll with you because I am on board with this decision. Because this then broke down into a little brawl and it didn't last very long. And they pulled apart and then they went their separate ways. So we're going to get a title unification. I reckon Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler will probably win that match and just be the undisputed women's tag team champions. But I have a question. Will they, will they defend this undisputed tag titles on NXT? If yes, then yeah, I'm with that. If not, 
No. I can't imagine Ronda doing it. It's weird to say this, but I feel like NXT have done well with their tag division better than the main roster tag division, actually. The title's ill-advised, but I feel like since then you had more influx of tag team and there's, there's been more focus on NXT of multiple female feuds. That's part of the reason why I'm happy with this feud because it's more than Oscar's you know, title. is more than just Bianca wants a rematch. It's more than the person we're going to talk about later that's made a return. There's more storylines going out. That for me is the reason why I was happy initially with Shane mm-hmm. and Ronda becoming a tag team because now right. the tag team have a storyline. Yay for women's wrestling. Give us more. Agreed. I think you've pretty much covered it, though. Yeah. Uh, probably a good decision, but we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, we had a very nice tribute package for uh, the life of the Iron Sheik. Rest in peace, Baba. I'll make you humble. Yeah. Um, and after that, we got the next Money in the Bank qualifying match, that being uh, EO Sky versus... Uh, no, wait, sorry. It was Bailey versus Meechin. That one was uh, later in the show. Bailey versus Meechin, and this match was again very short. Bailey goes to the outside. AJ Styles was on commentary this time, and a- Bailey was going up to him and being like, "Whoa, like this." And honestly, I remember virtually nothing from the match because it was basically a distraction for AJ Styles to have Scarlet blow red dust in his face. It was paprika. <laughs> yeah. It was cinnamon. Got him to do the cinnamon challenge. <laughs> yeah, that's what it, that's what it was. He went pff, cinnamon and in in yeah. pre cards mixed into his face. And Karrion Cross choked uh, AJ Styles out over the guardrail. And uh, yeah, and in that ensuing distraction, Bailey was able to pin Meechin before Meechin like kind of ran Scarlet off a little bit. And I, this was not in any way something monumental on this show, and it's just going to lead to like a mixed tag, and it'll probably, it, hopefully, it, it, be done there. It was announced later on in the show. It's going to be yeah. a mixed tag, yeah, yeah. But hopefully, that's then the end of this. But why are we still going here? I, I don't like my tolerance for Karrion Cross appears to be waning by the week, you know. And it's you have been the one, the one sat. You've been the guy who has been trying to be Mister Positivity when it comes to carrying cross. I am, and you know, if, if we just got a few goddamn weeks of good TV with the guy, I would try and be positive too. But like, oh my god, <laughs> I'm at my wits' end about this guy. Question. Yeah. So, um, Carrion and Scarlet are more established as as a as a duo. So on paper, should they win the match? Um, he needs something, all right? Remember, it's a mixed tag match. You can even have Scarlett pin Meechin, which sure. in itself sounds blasphemous too. But it's like he needs something because he's now verging on what people used to hate about Bray Wyatt's initial run, which is spooky, spooky, spooky. Doesn't back it up. Spooky, spooky, spooky. Doesn't back it up. So it's kind of like the next guy he feuds with, they should burst out laughing. You're like, you're, you're after me? Sure, sure, bro. Come, come to the ring. Let's wrestle. Your easy business. You never beat anyone. He needs signature victories, which he doesn't have. Yeah. And and unfortunately, he's almost becoming a WWE's version of Chris Jericho, where if people grow in the eye roll if he feuds with one of their favorites, right? The, the carrying cross vortex. Yeah. 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 I'm hoping this one doesn't go on too much longer. Next up, we had Bianca Belair backstage, and she's talking with Adam Pierce, and she's upset. You know, still, like, getting a little bit more of that NXT attitude, I've noticed. And that might just be because she's upset with her current situation. But maybe it's something more than that. It's something to keep an eye on, nonetheless. And Adam Pierce has Asuka's uh, championship presentation coming up after this. So needs Bianca to just not get involved. And he's like, oh, we'll get you a rematch. And she's like, all right, cool, works for me. Is it, isn't it fascinating when someone's been champion for a long time and then they've been accused of going stale because they, it's been the same thing day in and day out. The moment she loses the title, they've given her brand new motivation, which yep. has conjured out emotions we haven't seen in her in a while. Because you've been used to Bianca coming out, thanking the fans and you know being all positive and happy, but now she lost the title, we've seen a side of her we haven't seen in a long time. And I'm really loving it and appreciating it. It's making fans who's forgotten why they liked her in the first place. Yeah. It's, it's more relatable. She lost the title. And also, it's kind of reminded me of how they screwed, up Bret, they screwed over Bret Hart in 96 and 97 where they, they made him promises and later on, you know, those promises are not being kept. So I like that she's got a valid motivation for why she's got a chip on her shoulder. Like yeah. 
Yeah, no, I I totally agree. It also reminds me of Christian when he lost the world heavyweight title, and he was like, "Hey, defend the title against Randy Orton tonight on zero notice." And then like, you know, a month later, he gets screwed out, screwed over at the pay per view, and then he's like, "Teddy, give me a rematch." And he's like, "Well, Christian, I can't do that." It's like, I know. Why I know. not? I know. Why can you not? I anyway, that. I hate the, I hate the hole in, in in the logic. When it yeah. comes to wrestling, you have to suspend your disbelief. Yeah. You sure do, especially when it comes with on-air authority figures. Because next up, we did indeed have <sighs> Asuka's title championship presentation. So Adam Pierce is in the ring. Asuka doesn't get Triple H. Asuka gets Adam Pierce. Adam oh, Pierce say that, but oh. I'm just saying, you know, one's the COO and one is whatever Adam Pierce's job title is. Asuka comes out with the Raw Women's Championship. And she hands it over, and Adam Pearce says, all right, I'm here to pre- present you with the new WWE Women's Championship. And I'll give you three guesses as to what it looked like, fans. Three, two, one. Yeah, you got it first try. It is the WWE Women's Championship, the Raw Women's Championship, the SmackDown Women's Championship, except instead of red or blue, it's gold. Just like the men's belt. With white straps. With, wh- with a white strap. It's... Just so lazy. It is. But in terms of a lazy job, it's quite a nice looking lazy. Belt. It's a bet. I think the gold on the belt looks better with the white strap than the men's one does. Mm. I've seen a few different like mock ups of various belts where if you literally just like kind of tweak the colors and everything of it, then it, it looks it, it looks a lot better. It makes mm. it pop. But my God, like, <laughs> you know, when people were talking like a week ago about like, oh, we've seen like eight different belt reveals of the same belt over the last 10 years. Just I said, add another one onto the list. It's the same design for 10 it, no, years. No, but I think but I, okay, so to make sense out of nonsense in Vince's mind, Please. you've got to get the W. That's the brand. That's the, they're pushing the brand. It used to be back in the days, it used to be subtle. The the the, the logo insignia used to be on the top, right? Mm-hmm. And then nowadays it's like it's the main thing. It's in your face. It's the branding. Can I yes. can I counter this point? Go, go ahead. And I'll try and use corporate douchebaggery think. Oh yeah. Because of course, look who we're dealing with. You want the branding, sure. What about selling these belts to kids? And everything. Like, think about the merchandising. Like, I'm sure there are people who still have done it, but I have to imagine that these belts have taken a hit in merchandise sales since they made them all look the same. Hmm. Like, if each of these belts looked completely different, the WWE Universal, the the new one, the Undisputed, whatever, both the women's, if they all look totally different, would fans not be more inclined to, like, buy all of them if you're one of those fans who buys all the belts and stuff? Now that you said it, imagine someone's whole mantle. They got all the the current It's just the same belt, like, six times. Yeah, that is, you know what, that is quite... Because you did say that as hasn't taken a dip. I would like to actually look do research yeah. into it. Or fans in the comment section, can you please do the research and put down in the comments if uh, the belt merchandising is taking a dip in terms of sales because all the belts look the same. The tag titles are next, by the way. They're yeah. next for rebranding. But I ain't going to get excited now. Cause I, was, I was getting excited because we're, we're going to get a new design. We're just probably going to get the same penny, yeah. but gold See, again. Okay. Now that I've got that out of my system, I want to be positive for a second. Because we have been talking since the draft about what they're going to do with this women's championship situation. Yes, Considering the belts were color-coded and on the wrong shows. And we were sat there going like, are they going to fix this problem? They haven't fixed this problem yet, and it's been a little while. And now both the, well, Rhea hadn't lost the title, but Bianca had. And you could have swapped the belts if you wanted to do that. I wouldn't have recommended it. What we got... Title design aside, the solution that they came up with is by far the best possible solution they could have had. Everyone suggested that as well. Yes. Everybody at the time was talking about, you need to just stop color coding the belts, give them a non-brand specific name, and that's the problem dealt with. And I will give them full credit. That is exactly what they did. Bravo. (laughs) Well done. Now, to get to the actual point of this segment, because it is not the belt and everything. Oh, no. no. Who makes her return to SmackDown but Charlotte Flair? 
First time since WrestleMania. First time since WrestleMania. And she comes out and she goes to the ring and Adam Pierce says, no, 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 Charlotte, you can't just cut in line. You have to wait in line. Charlotte says, I don't wait in line. I am the line. I started the line. That's a baby face. I am the opportunity. Yeah. And she is the line and the opportunity. So... Oscar and Charlotte go back and forth, and Oscar says, "Like, I, I, no one respects you more than me. You know that." Uh, boils down to, "I want a title shot. I want a shot at your championship." And Oscar speaks in Japanese, and then she spits mist at Charlotte. But I made the same joke on the edited review. She missed. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. I love it. Oh, let that soak that in. That, that, that's that's a great pun. I'm, I love that joke. So I'm gonna... Charlotte bounced Oscar's head off in the little presentation podium thing, and then she rolled to the outside. And it was announced because she accepted the championship match mm. in her Japanese. She may have said it in English. I, I'm in the middle of it. I can't. I can't remember. But the bottom line is, she accepted the title match. And they are having a championship match the night before Money in the Bank, which seemed very odd. I that makes me believe that they'll do like a three way at the pay per view with Bianca. Maybe, because otherwise, why is that not just the pay per view match, right? Now let's also talk about the other elephant in the room. Charlotte always wins. There right? is this. But so for me, what what makes me laugh about the whole segment is I actually predicted this back in Night of Champions. I said that if Oscar wins against Bianca, she'll lose to Charlotte Flair. Albeit, I didn't think it would be this this early that Charlotte will come back and challenge for the title. But now that she has, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic because I feel like they're playing on the trope of Charlotte always wins. Because the whole point of is to create that. A sense of doubt. I mean, it, it, we can't always predict who's going to win. That that they're going to feed into the fact that um, Oscar never has beaten mm-hmm. Charlotte one on one as a hook for us to watch the show to see if the, it happens. But obviously, we've got someone that's a bit disgruntled that want the title back, and I think that person may play a hand in what's going to happen. And I think yeah. it might be the start of a storyline going into SummerSlam. Mm -hmm. what's going to happen yeah I think that is also likely thinking about it more I think it's also possible that you could see like a DQ or something like that in the the Smackdown match and then that leads to some sort of rematch possibly triple threat whatever at Money in the Bank I don't know I don't know I do think you're completely right in that Charlotte has that kind of like feeling about her that you know like John Cena used to have where it's just like You go into a match, and the matches that I always cared the most about were the ones where I really wanted to see someone beat John Cena because there's always the possibility, regardless of if it's the right booking decision or not, that Cena would win anyway. Charlotte's very much the same way. I think that Charlotte versus Asuka could could be a very good match. I would bet that it would be. I don't want to see the title in Charlotte's hands anytime soon. What I want, by the way, is Oscar to be better defined, uh, her character. Because at the moment, because we love her, she's only um, done bad things to Bianca. I want to see her. The, the issue with, with Oscar on the main roster is we've never gotten her motivations. Mm-hmm. Yes, I completely agree, and this she, is what I was saying earlier. Yeah, in the year. she's been a walking title holder. That's yeah. that's what she does, and and it could work if they made her defend the title every week. I think that's what got her over is the fact that she was a fighting champion, so you sure. didn't really know her motivation. It's just you're next, no one's ready. You're next, no one's ready. You're next, no one's ready. That, that's been her entire story. But on the main roster, where they pride more storytelling, more complex or layered storytelling, they haven't evolved her character. And there's a great time to do that. Don't use the whole language barrier thing. There's ways you can go around it. I'm happy they're letting them letting uh, EO and Oscar speak in a native language because they're they're more comfortable in it. You can see it in a presentation, a delivery. 
And it, you should go more with that. It doesn't matter if you want to use subtitles or whatever you want to use to, in order for us to understand. And I don't care if I don't understand it. I just love how passionate they are when they speak it because I can kind of tell where it's going. It sounds negative, so she's saying something negative. It sounds happy, so she's saying something happy. I don't mind, but there's more you can do with Oscar for being champion. It, it can't be, oh, well, we don't know how to book her, blah, blah. No, you can book her as champion. We need to know, know her motivation. It would be interesting if this title run is the defining title run for her. Amen to that. I fully agree. Call brief. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> call brief. I'm trying not to do the sniffles because I can tell it might sound bad on the microphone if I do the sniffles. So I'm legit trying to not. Oh. ASMR. Disgusting ASMR. We had the backstage segment with Jay Uso and Paul Heyman after that. And then also backstage, Bianca Belair is pissed because she was going to get a title shot. And then we saw what just happened there. And Adam Pierce was like, I'll, I'll handle it. No, what happened was he was bragging on the phone. It wasn't like he was sorry. He was like, this is great. I could have planned better myself. Ask and Charlotte Flair. And they're like, oh, oh, all right. It, he wasn't even sorry about it. You, He got caught gloating on the phone, saying this is a box office match, and he's so happy. And then you go, oh, yeah, I made it. See, Chelsea Green's onto something. And Pierce, you sometimes are not good at your job. You don't say. Anywho, we then had our next Money in the Bank qualifying match between Butch and Baron Corbin. Another very short match. A lot of the matches on the show were very short. Very Attitude Era-esque. Yeah. This was definitely a uh, show for segments mm. and angles as opposed to matches. And I thought still a good one, but, you know, this next match, Butch and Baron Corbin, had Carmelo... Hayes and Trick Williams in the front row at ringside. They, from of NXT, course, just in case. From you NXT, know. Yeah. Carmelo Hayes, the NXT champion. They are engaged in an NXT feud with Baron Corbin, and I find it hilarious that Baron Corbin can't buy a win on the main roster, but he's supposedly feuding with the NXT champion down there. But what, what have you, I'll, I'll roll with it. And Baron Corbin cuts another promo before the match, saying that, you know, I'll, I'm a knock you guys down again if you, uh, you know, send you back to NXT and, and such after I qualify so I can win Money in the Bank again. I, I try and forget that Baron Corbin won Money in the Bank the first time. I actually forgot that too. Yeah. But he had a different look back in the day. So he sure forget. did. He sure did. And this match, again, very short. Butch ran, ran at him, took him down, focused on the uh, the hand, did joint manipulation. Baron Corbin hit him with a a backbreaker at one point, and that was really all of the offense that he managed to get in. And Butch snapped his fingers, and Baron Corbin got back in the ring, went for a choke slam, but Butch rolled through into kind of like a cross arm breaker looking. Yeah, Juju Katami style. Yeah. And instead, just like rolled him up and hooked a leg, and Corbin could have kicked out, but it's fine. It's nitpicky. And Butch wins. That's good. I like that. It is the proper decision because the man's coming home to England. And I don't think he's going to win, but I think if he's going to come out as Pete Dunn, that would be a really cool time to do it. I was going to ask you if you think that's when they're going to announce him as Pete Dunn and the ovation and the cheering of the crowd. Can you imagine he comes out to his old music? The, the, the saddest thing is, he okay, I can't say he won't, because Sami Zayn has proven that you can still go, you know, CFOs. Mm -hmm. his, his CFOs theme is elite. I love it. I said that music just pulsates and then you feel that sense of dread. And then when he does that thing to his cheeks when his music's blaring, oh, chills. His, the, the other one that he had, I'm like, what makeshift song? What, who who mm -hmm. made that? You know what? It's not time for Sats rants because I can't breathe. <laughs> yes. Go back to the original. So after this match, of course, Baron Corbin goes over and he punches Trick Williams, gets punched by Carmelo Hayes, and then they get pulled apart by referees and security and everything. You go backstage, and Butch is very happy. said, I'm going to go home where every night is fight night. And he's with the Brawling Brutes, and they're chanting. They're every and Baron Corbin walks there. He's like, no, that wasn't fair. Wah. And then Cameron Grimes walks up behind him, taps him on the shoulder, punches him, put him puts him into the shutter doors, and, and then leaves him laying. Because last week, Cameron Grimes said that the next time he sees Baron Corbin on SmackDown, he's going to drop him. That's a weird motivation. Cameron Grimes, you, you've you beaten Baron Corbin. You know who you should do? Challenge Austin Theory. And Challenge win. Austin Theory. By the way, come on, you have to admit, right? I know you, you don't want to admit. I don't, don't want to force you to admit, you know. you know. Uh, Baron Corbin is good in his role, no? 
Paracorbin in these small doses, I think, is fine. You know, like, see, here's the thing. Baron Corbin, as someone, to come out here and lose a qualifying match against somebody he's not in a feud with and go backstage and be, com- and be whiny and complainy and then get laid out again, I think is totally fine. My issue then comes with when that guy is the first feud for someone like Cameron Grimes. Because it makes Cameron Grimes feel like, well, why are you kind of wasting your time with this guy who you just beat in eight seconds? I know Baron Corbin like attacked him from behind out a week after that. I get it, but you get caught in the Baron Corbin vortex, and it's been it's just been so many guys' first feud after being called up from NXT, and it just makes me feel like they are unimportant by association. I think Baron Corbin is a good in ring performer for men of his size. He could be a lot worse in the sure. ring. Sure. And he's decent on the microphone. And when given, I feel like booking's been the reason why. In the beginning, it was because, you know, his social media posts would get him in trouble, hence why he didn't win past money in the bank. But I feel like he has matured as a person. And I'm hoping a man of that size, he's six foot six, legit. With proper fine tuning, he can be a monster hill again. I feel like he's got it in him. It, you you could have a lot worse people on the main roster. I, 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 that's what I'm saying. That's the reason why I'm caping for it because I'm like he's not as bad as the internet make him out to be. He's actually kind of underrated and selfless as well. To be put in that kind of like who who whose neck did he break to be punished like that? Listen, I think no matter what happens, I don't think I can ever forgive him for happy talk. Sin. Really? Doing oh, doing wait. my SmackDown reviews and having to listen to Happy Talk every single week for like six or nine months or whatever. I, I couldn't do it. Interesting. If it was me, if it was a question, why do you think Tempest does not like Baron Corbin? I would have said, uh, did GM run or he beat Kurt Angle? I mean, those are also good reasons. That Happy Talk show that he had with Madcap Moss where Madcap was just telling annoying ass jokes. It's Madcap you don't like. I also don't like Madcap. <laughs> I didn't like either of them. No, it, Madcap they dragged, were on every show. Madcap dragged him down. He's he was good. He's good by himself. Uh, Corbin, Corbin. When he comes to London, Corbin, you're gonna get a chance for me. Corbin. Eh, not for me. We had another Money in the Bank qualifying match, however, uh, the last one on this show, as Io Sky faced Shotzi, and this was a really funny match because, again, short Shotzi was just being pestered by Bailey the entire time. At the like the bell rings and Bailey like reaches for Shotzi's uh foot in the corner. Reaches for it. And they go back and forth a little bit and they end up on the top rope and Bailey's trying to grab at Shotzi again and she kind of gets kicked away mm. and it looks like Eo's going to hit her with a superplex. But Io gets dropped into the ring, and the referee goes to check on her. And that's when Bailey hops up onto the apron and pulls Shotzi's leg out. So she falls and lands, and then Io, uh, Io hits the moonsault and wins. Now, that's the right decision. Io Sky should be in Money in the Bank. Absolutely. I would like to see her maybe even win Money in the Bank. Maybe. I, right. Well, like, it, the funny thing is, yeah, I want Io to win, but there's a part of me thinking Bailey could potentially win. I as think well. either of them would be very good choices. Yeah. But holy hell, where is Shotzi's backup in this situation? She's a raw. The show is so stupid. I hate it. I can't stand this draft stuff. To, like, to be honest, right? You know what? Yeah, I, I know. I know you're getting that. Yeah, Tegan Knox. Sure, right? That could be a great time for her to come back. Is she or... not on Raw too? Bloody, I don't know who's on Raw. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't point, know. Dana, is, Dana Brooke. <laughs> point is, they came out just like a few weeks ago and said that Raquel was Shotzi's new partner. Why would they do that if they were going to be on different brands so they could just be a team for one tag match? I think I think, anyway. I think that's what they, they didn't say. That, that, that probably was the fine print. Tag team for only one match in, in the case if they lose. In yeah. the case they win, she will go over. I'm assuming. We're, we're trying know. to fit. We're filling in the blanks that we shouldn't fill in, right? Yeah, I'm <laughs> trying my best here. And it's like, you know... People go through stretches where they hate damage control and they're all like, no, we must take down damage control. We must be united. And then like, then matches like this happen where damage and damage control is running amok and then no one comes to save Shotzi. And it's a small thing, I guess, but. As of right now, do you think damage damage control could be saved? Not really. 
Because it's been a while since they did I the think, rift. I think there could be something fun between Bailey and EO. I think there's still something on the table to do there. In terms of match or, or, or teaming up? A match, a team that breaks up, what have you. There's a story to be told between Bailey and EO Sky, for sure. And I think adding Money in the Bank into the mix there would be great fun. Maybe Bailey beats Rhea Ripley, and then EO cashes in on her, or vice versa. I was thinking. I think there's loads that you could do with. I was this. thinking they might go with the Sandow Cody route of like he uh, Bailey betrays a partner and takes the briefcase and then Eo wins. Eo can win the briefcase off Bailey and then go and cash it in on whoever. They does can. does Eo beat Oscar and then Bailey cash in on Eo? That's another option, but it's kind of like how how would EO EO would have to win the number one contender if she mm-hmm. loses money in the bank? Yeah, that that, that could be, be an that. option. There's many options, but I'm excited. If anything, it should be EO that defrauds Oscar, but Oscar at least give it a title to I don't know Survivor Series or something. If you're itching that hard or Royal Rumble, like I want her. You know what? I just want Oscar to win at WrestleMania for goodness sake. So the worst streak going. Yeah. Bloody heck. Yeah. So the last thing on the show that we haven't talked about, because we had Austin Theory's backstage promo, was a backstage interaction between all of the tag teams in the world. And it was a bizarre little segment. Very funny staging, because it was Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn who were there, and they were, you know, just talking about whatever. Sami Zayn is upset about the bloodline, as per usual. And they get interrupted by Pretty Deadly. And then you just keep adding tag teams to this mix. You had the OC, you had the LWO, you had the Brawling Brutes, you had uh, the, the Street Profits. Street Profits. And Adam Pierce like pops out of nowhere. What's and, going on here? What's going on? <laughs> and Kevin Owens is like, no, stop it. I can't take anymore. Because I love Kevin Owens' gimmick of like just hating wrestling tropes. It's fantastic. And Adam Pierce announces that all of those teams will compete in a gauntlet match for a shot at the tag team titles, I believe, next week. And everyone went, hooray, legit. Hooray! And that was SmackDown. All in all, I think it was a pretty good show. Like, it wasn't a wrestling-heavy edition of SmackDown. The opening match, I thought, was by far the best match on the show. Really fun, that. But all the matches had stakes. I like that a lot. Mm. We had important things happening on the show, which is not always the case with Roman Reigns not present, whether that be the Bloodline stuff, or in this case, a new belt being presented and Charlotte Flair's return and a title unification match set for for, for further down the line. So a pretty monumental SmackDown. I'd probably give this SmackDown like a four out of five. You're never bored with SmackDown because it felt like it, it kept going. Yeah. It's like it's not like uh, there was a lot of filler. I feel like everything was set even to the point where they announced a lot of match for next week as well, which is quite exciting. So I liked it. Even though, you know, SmackDown ten- tends to be the, the wrestling show for a show that didn't feature a lot of wrestling. It featured a lot of things that set up for next week. So hopefully next week will be a more wrestling heavy show. But yeah, I really enjoyed it and I can't wait to see what Roman Reigns thinks about all of this. It's What's Jay. What's causing, causing all, of this? all of this? I realize we didn't do a fusion. Do you want to do a fusion? Yeah, it's never too late. <laughs> <laughs> give me that strength. I need it. Very good. I'll give you my strength. So that wraps up our SmackDown review. But before we go, of course, we have some very th- uh, special people to thank. Those being our $25 and above pledge hammers over at patreon.com forward slash wrestle talk, where if you subscribe to the $25 and above tier, you can get your own custom wrestling nickname read out on a show just like this one, such as He Brings the Fear, Amir Jones. Yeah. Andrew Gifford, the Big Red Dog. Yeah. The Shrock Master, Austin Shrock. Yeah. Bob, the Ninja Goldfish. Yeah. Shawn Michaels' biggest fan, Brett Guy. Yeah. The Eco Warrior, Brian. Yeah. Chris, Hellfire Brimstone. Yeah. Infinite Crisis, Chris Jenkins. Yeah. Chris, the Cypriot Sensation, Petru. Yeah. The Turtleneck Tyrant, Christian Cooper. Yeah. All-Star Chuck Turner. Yeah. Goldy, the Terminator, Moody. Yeah. And shout out to Cody the Terminator Moody. He's one of the people that got a cameo from me this week. I'm on Cameo now. So make sure you check out Tempest on Cameo. If you want a cameo, I'll do a cameo for you. If you want us to hug on Cameo, I'll do it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Just send in the cameo on Saturdays while I'm here and you'll get content of me hugging him or a high five. You want a hot tag? Oh, blah, blah, blah. Hell yeah. It. 
So make sure, of course, uh, you know, subscribe to all the channels. Like this video if you haven't. Leave the comments down below. Who do you think is going to win Money in the Bank? What did you think of the Bloodline segments on this show? What do you think of the new belt? What do you think Charlotte's going to do that now that she's back? Let us know the answers to all of the above. Make sure that you give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe. Pardon me if you haven't already. Make sure you subscribe to all the other Wrestle Talk and Wrestle Talk adjacent channels. And we will see you next time. The house always wins. Ah.